The discovery and understanding of the ancient civilizations has been a process of continuous astonishment, of incredible realizations. The monuments of antiquity, pyramids, ziggurats, vast platforms, columned ruins, carved stones, would have remained enigmas, mute evidence to bygone events, were it not for the written word. Were it not for that, the ancient monuments would have remained puzzles, their age uncertain, their creators obscure, their purpose unclear. We owe what we know to the ancient scribes, a prolific and meticulous lot who used monuments, artifacts, foundation stones, bricks, utensils, weapons of any conceivable material, as inviting slates on which to write down names and record events. Above all, there were the clay tablets, flattened pieces of wet clay, some small enough to be held in the palm of the hand, on which the scribe deftly embossed with a stylus the symbols that formed syllables, words, and sentences. Then the tablet would be left to dry, or be kiln-dried, and a permanent record had been created, a record that has survived millennia of natural erosion and human destructiveness. In place after place, in centers of commerce or of administration, in temples and palaces, in all parts of the ancient Near East, there were both state and private archives full of such tablets. And there were also actual libraries where the tablets, tens of thousands of them, were neatly arranged by subject, their contents entitled, their scribe named, their sequel numbered. Invariably, whenever they dealt with history or science or the gods, they were identified as copies of earlier tablets, tablets in the olden language. Astounded as the archaeologists were to discover the grandeur of Assyria and Babylonia, they were even more puzzled to read in their inscriptions of olden cities. And what was the meaning of the title King of Sumer and Akkad that the kings of these empires coveted so much? It was only with the discovery of the records concerning Sargon of Agada that modern scholars were able to convince themselves that a great kingdom, the kingdom of Akkad, had indeed arisen in Mesopotamia half a millennium before Assyria and Babylonia were to flourish. It was with the greatest amazement that scholars read in these records that Sargon defeated Uruk and tore down its wall. Sargon, king of Agada, was victorious over the inhabitants of Ur. He defeated A. Nimar and tore down its wall and defeated its territory from Lagash as far as the sea. His weapons he washed in the sea. In the battle with the inhabitants of Uma, he was victorious. The scholars were incredulous. Could there have been urban centers, walled cities, even before Sargon of Agada, even before 2500 BC? As is now known, indeed, there were. These were the cities and urban centers of Sumer, the Sumer in the title King of Sumer and Akkad. It was as a century of archaeological discoveries and scholarly research has established, the land where civilization began nearly 6,000 years ago, where suddenly and inexplicably, as though out of nowhere, there appeared a written language and literature, kings and priests, schools and temples, doctors and astronomers, high-rise buildings, canals, docks and ships, an intensive agriculture, an advanced metallurgy, a textile industry, trade and commerce, laws and concepts of justice and morality, cosmological theories, and tales and records of history and prehistory. In all these writings, be it long epic tales or two-line proverbs, in inscriptions mundane or divine, the same facts emerge as an unshakable tenet of the Sumerians and the peoples that followed them. In bygone days, the Din Gur, the righteous ones of the rocket ships, the beings the Greeks began to call gods, had come to earth from their own planet, 
They chose southern Mesopotamia to be their home away from home. They called the land ki en -Gur, land of the Lord of the Rockets. The Akkadian name Shumer meant land of the guardians. The statement that the first to establish settlements on Earth were astronauts from another planet was not lightly made by the Sumerians. In text after text, whenever the starting point was recalled, it was always this, 432,000 years before the deluge, the Din Gur, righteous ones of the rocket ships, came down to Earth from their own planet. The Sumerians considered it a twelfth member of our solar system, a system made up of the sun in the center, the moon, all the nine planets we know of today, and one more large planet whose orbit lasts a SAR, 3,600 Earth years. This orbit, they wrote, takes the planet to a station in the distant heavens, then brings it back to Earth's vicinity, crossing between Mars and Jupiter. It was in that position, as depicted in a 4,500-year-old Sumerian drawing, which can be found under the heading Figure 19, that the planet obtained its name, Nibiru, crossing, and its symbol, the cross. The leader of the astronauts who had come to Earth from Nibiru, we know from numerous ancient texts, was called Ea, whose house is water. After he had landed and established Eridu, the first Earth station, he assumed the title Enki. A text that was discovered in the ruins of Sumer records his landing on Earth as a first-person report. When I approached Earth, there was much flooding. When I approached its green meadows, heaps and mounds were piled up at my command. I built my house in a pure place. My house, its shade stretches over the snake marsh. The text then proceeds to describe Ea's efforts to build extraordinary waterworks in the marshlands at the head of the Persian Gulf. He surveyed the marshlands, cut canals for drainage and water control, built dikes, dug ditches, and built structures of bricks molded from the local clays. He joined the Tigris and Euphrates rivers by canals, and at the edge of the marshlands he built his water house, with a wharf and other facilities. It all had a reason. On his planet, gold was needed, not for jewelry or another frivolous use, for at no time during the millennia that followed were these visitors to Earth ever shown wearing golden jewelry. Gold was no doubt required for the space programs of the Niburians, as is evident from the Hindu text's reference to the celestial chariots being covered with gold. Indeed, gold is vital to many aspects of the space instruments and vehicles of our own times, but that alone could not have been the reason for the intensity of the Nibiruans' search for gold on Earth and their immense efforts to obtain it here and transfer it in large quantities to their own planet. The metal, with its unique properties, was needed back home for a vital need, affecting the very survival of life on that planet. As best as we can make out, this vital need could have been for suspending the gold particles in Nibiru's waning atmosphere and thus shield it from critical dissipation. A son of Nibiru's ruler, Ea was well chosen for the mission. He was a brilliant scientist and engineer whose nickname was Nudimud, he who fashions things. The plan, as his epithet name, Ea, indicated, was to extract the gold from the waters of the quiet Persian Gulf and the adjoining shallow marshlands that extended from the Gulf into Mesopotamia. Sumerian depictions showing Ea as lord of the flowing waters, sitting in a laboratory and surrounded by interconnected flasks, which can be found in the bonus PDF material under the heading Figure 20. But the unfolding tale suggests that all was not going well with this scheme. The gold production was far below expectations, and to speed it up, more astronauts, the rank and file were called Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came, landed on earth. They came in groups of 50, 
and one of the texts reveals that one of these groups was led by Enki's firstborn son, Marduk. The text records Marduk's urgent message to his father describing a near calamity on the flight to Earth. As the spaceship passed by one of the solar system's large planets, probably Jupiter, and almost collided with one of that planet's satellites, describing the attack on the spacecraft, the excited Marduk told his father, It has been created like a weapon. It has charged forward like death. The Anunnaki who are fifty it has smitten. The flying bird-like supreme orbiter it has smitten on the breast. A Sumerian engraving on a cylinder seal, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading Figure 21, may well have illustrated the scene of Lord Earth on the left, anxiously greeting his son, dressed as an astronaut on the right, as the spaceship leaves Mars, the six-pointed star, and nears Earth, a seventh planet when counting from the outside in, symbolized by the seven dots and depicted together with the moon. Back on the home planet, where Enki's father, An, Anu in Akkadian, was the ruler, the progress of the landing parties was followed with anxiety and expectation. These must have turned to impatience at the slow progress, and then to disappointment. Evidently, the scheme to extract gold from seawaters by laboratory-like processes did not work as expected, but the gold was still badly needed, and the Anunnaki faced a tough decision to abandon the project, which was out of the question, or to try to obtain the gold in a new way, mining. For gold, the Anunnaki knew by then, was naturally available in abundance in the Abzu, the primeval source on the continent of Africa. In the Semitic languages that had evolved from the Sumerian, Za'ab, Abzu, in reverse, has remained the word for gold to this very day. There was, however, one major problem. The African gold had to be extracted from the depths of the earth through mining, and the far-reaching decision to change from the sophisticated water treatment process to a back-breaking toil below the surface of the earth was not lightly taken. Clearly, the new enterprise required more Anunnaki, a mining colony in the place of the Shining Lodes, expanded facilities in Mesopotamia, and a fleet of ore vessels, Magur, Urnu, Abzu, ships for ores of the Abzu, to connect the two. Could Enki handle it all by himself? Anu felt that he could not, and eight Nibiru years after Enki's landing, 28,800 Earth years, he came to Earth to see things for himself. He came down accompanied by the heir apparent, Enlil, Lord of the Command, a son who Anu must have felt could take charge of Earth mission and organize the gold deliveries to Nibiru. The choice of Enlil for the mission might have been a necessary one, but it must have been an agonizing one as well, for it only sharpened the rivalry and jealousy between the two half-brothers. For Inki was the firstborn son of Anu by Id, one of his six concubines, and could have expected to follow Anu on Nibiru's throne. But then, as in the biblical tale of Abraham, his concubine Hagar and his half-sister wife Sarah, Anu's half-sister wife Antum, bore him a son, Enlil, and by the Nibiruan rules of succession, so faithfully adopted by the biblical patriarch, Enlil became the legal heir instead of Enki, and now this rival, this robber of Enki's birthright, came to Earth to take over the command. One cannot stress enough the importance of lineage and genealogy in the wars of the gods, the struggles for succession and supremacy on Nibiru as on Earth later on. Indeed, as we unravel the puzzling persistence and ferocity of the wars of the gods, trying to fit them into the framework of history and prehistory, a task never undertaken before. It becomes clear that they stemmed from a code of sexual behavior based not on morality, but on considerations of genetic purity. 
At the core of these wars lay an intricate genealogy that determined hierarchy and succession, and sexual acts were judged not by their tenderness or violence, but by their purpose and outcome. There is a Sumerian tale of how Enlil, commander-in-chief of the Anunnaki, took a fancy to a young nurse whom he saw swimming naked in the river. He persuaded her to go sailing with him and made love to her against her protestations. My vulva is small, it knows not intercourse. In spite of his rank, Enlil was arrested by the fifty senior gods as he returned to his city Nippur and was found by the seven Anunnaki who judge to have committed the crime of rape. They sentenced him to exile in the Abzu. He was pardoned only when he married the young goddess, who had followed him into exile. Many songs celebrated the love affair between Inanna and a young god named Dumuzi, in which their sleepouts were described with touching tenderness. Oh, that they put his hand in my hand for me. Oh, that they put his heart next to my heart for me. Not only is it sweet to sleep hand in hand with him, sweetest of sweet is also the loveliness of joining heart to heart with him. We can understand the approving tone of the verse because Dumuzi was the intended bridegroom of Inanna, chosen by her with the approval of her brother, Utu, Shamash. But how to explain a text in which Inanna describes passionate lovemaking with her own brother? My beloved met me, took his pleasure of me, rejoiced together with me. The brother brought me to his house, made me lie on its sweet bed. In unison, the tongue-making in unison, my brother of fairest face, made fifty times. This can only be understood if we bear in mind that the code prohibited marriage, but not love-making, between full brother and sister. On the other hand, marriage with a half-sister was allowed. Male progeny by a half-sister even had precedence in the hierarchical order. And while rape was condemned, sex, even irregular and violent, was condoned if done for the sake of succession to the throne. A long tale relates how Enki, seeking a male son by his and Enlil's half-sister Sud, forced his attentions on her when she was alone and poured the semen in the womb. When she gave birth to a daughter, rather than to a son, Inky lost no time making love to the girl as soon as she became young and fair, and took his joy of her, he embraced her, lay in her lap, he touches the thighs, he touches the, with the young one, he cohabits. This went on unabashedly with a succession of young daughters, until Sud put a curse on Enki, which paralyzed him, only then did these sexual antics in search of a male heir stop. When Enki engaged in these sexual efforts, he was already espoused to Ninki, which illustrates that the same code which condemned rape did not prohibit extramarital affairs, per se. We also know that the gods were allowed any number of wives and concubines, but if married, they had to select one as their official spouse, preferring, as we have mentioned, a half-sister for this role. If the god, apart from his given name and many epithets, was also bestowed with a title name, his official consort was also honored with the feminine form of such title. Thus, when An received his title name, the Heavenly, his consort was called Antu, Anyu, and Antum in Akkadian. The nurse who had married Enlil, Lord of Command, received the title name Ninlil, Lady of Command. Enki's spouse, Damkina, was also called Ninki, and so on. Because of the importance of the family relationships between these great Anunnaki, many so-called god lists prepared by ancient scribes were genealogical in nature. In one such major list, titled by the ancient scribes the An, Ilu Anum series, there are listed the 42 foreparents of Enlil, clearly arranged as 21 divine couples. This must have been a mark of great royal lineage, 
for two similar documents for Anu also list his 21 ancestral couples on Nibiru. We learn that the parents of Anu were Anshargal, Great Prince of Heaven, and Kishargal, Great Princess of Firm Ground. As their names indicate, they were not the reigning couple on Nibiru. Rather, the father was the Great Prince, meaning the heir apparent, and his spouse was a Great Princess, the firstborn daughter of the ruler by a different wife, and thus a half-sister of Ashargal. In these genealogical facts lies the key to the understanding of the events on Nibiru before the landing on Earth and on Earth thereafter. Sending Ea to Earth for gold implies that the Nibiruans had already been aware of the metal's availability on Earth well before the landing was launched. How? One could offer several answers. They could have probed Earth with unmanned satellites, as we have been doing to other planets in our solar system. They could have surveyed Earth by landing on it, as we have done on our moon. Indeed, their landing on Mars cannot be ruled out as we read texts dealing with the space voyages from Nibiru to Earth. Whether and when such manned, premeditated landings on Earth had taken place, we do not know. But there does exist an ancient chronicle dealing with an earlier landing in dramatic circumstances, when the deposed ruler of Nibiru escaped to Earth in his spacecraft. The event must have happened before Ea was sent to Earth by his father, for it was through that event that Anu became Nibiru's ruler. Indeed, the event was the usurpation of the throne on Nibiru by Anu. The information is contained in a text whose Hittite version has been titled by scholars, Kingship in Heaven. It throws light on life at the royal court of Nibiru and tells a tale of betrayal and usurpation worthy of a Shakespearean plot. It reveals that when the time for succession arrived on Nibiru, through natural death or otherwise, it was not Anshargal, Anu's father and the heir apparent, who had ascended the throne. Instead, a relative named Alalu, Alalush in the Hittite text, became the ruler. As a gesture of reconciliation or by custom, Alalu appointed Anu to be his royal cupbearer, an honored and trusted position also known to us from several Near Eastern texts and royal depictions which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading Figure 22. But after nine Niburian years, Anu, Anush in the Hittite text, gave battle to Alalu and deposed him. Once in the olden days, Alalush was king in heaven. Alalush was seated on the throne. The mighty Anush, first among the gods, was standing before him. He would bow to his feet, set the drinking cup in his hand. For nine counted periods, Alalush was king in heaven. In the ninth counted period, Anush gave battle to Alalush. It was then, the ancient text tells us, that the dramatic flight to earth had occurred. Alalush was defeated. He fled before Anush. Down he descended to the dark-hued earth. Anush took his seat upon the throne. While it is quite possible that much about Earth and its resources may have been known on Nibiru even before Alalu's flight, the fact is that we do have in this tale a record of the arrival on Earth of a spaceship bearing Niburians before Ea's mission to Earth. The Sumerian king lists report that the first administrator of Eridu was called Alulim, a name that could have been yet another epithet for Ea, Enki, or the Sumerian rendering of Alalu's name. The possibility thus comes to mind that, though deposed, Alalu was sufficiently concerned about Nibiru's fate to advise his deposer that he had found gold in Earth's waters. That this is indeed what had happened might be indicated by the fact that a reconciliation between deposed and deposer did ensue. 
For Anyu went ahead and appointed Kumarbi, a grandson of Alalu, to be his royal cupbearer. But the gesture of reconciliation only caused history on Nibiru to repeat itself. In spite of all the bestowed honors, the young Kumarbi could not forget that Anyu had usurped the throne from his grandfather. And as time went on, Kumarbi's enmity toward Anyu was becoming more and more obvious, and Anyu could not withstand the gaze of Kumarbi's eyes. And so it was that, having decided to leave Nibiru for Earth, and even take the heir apparent and Lil with him, Anyu deemed it safer also to take along the young Kumarbi. Both decisions, to take and Lil with him and to take Kumarbi along, ended up making the visit one marred by strife and, for Anyu, also filled with personal agony. The decision to bring Enlil to Earth and put him in charge led to heated arguments with Enki, arguments echoed in the texts so far discovered. The angry Enki threatened to leave Earth and return to Nibiru, but could he be trusted not to usurp the throne there? If, as a compromise, Anyu himself were to stay on Earth, appointing Enlil as surrogate ruler on Nibiru, could Enlil be trusted to step down when Anyu returned? Finally, it was decided to draw lots, let chance determine how it shall be. The division of authority that ensued is repeatedly mentioned in Sumerian and Akkadian texts. One of the longest of the Earth Chronicles, a text called the Atrahasis Epic, records the drawings of Lots and its outcome. The gods clasped hands together, then cast Lots and divided. On you to heaven went up. To Enlil the earth was made subject. That which the sea as a loop encloses, they gave to the prince Enki. To the Abzu Enki went down assumed the rulership of the Abzu. Believing that he had managed to separate the rival brothers, Anyu to heaven went up. But in the skies above earth, an unexpected turn of events awaited him. Perhaps as a precaution, Kumarbi was left on the space platform orbiting earth. When Anyu returned to it, ready to take off on the long voyage back to Nibiru, he was confronted by an angry Kumarbi. Harsh words soon gave way to a scuffle. Anyu gave battle to Kumarbi. Kumarbi gave battle to Anyu. As Kumarbi bested Anyu in the wrestling, Anyu struggled free from the hands of Kumarbi. But Kumarbi managed to grab Anyu by his feet and bit between his knees, hurting Anyu in his manhood. Ancient depictions were found of the event, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading figure 23a as well as of the habit of wrestling Anunnaki, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading Figure 23b, to hurt one another in the genitals. Disgraced and in pain, Anyu took off on his way to Nibiru, leaving Kumarbi behind with the astronauts manning the space platforms and shuttlecraft. But before he departed, he put on Kumarbi a curse of three monsters in his belly. The similarity of this Hittite tale to the Greek tale of the castration of Uranus by Kronos and the swallowing by Kronos of his sons needs no elaboration. And as in the Greek tales, this episode set the stage for the wars between the gods and the Titans. After Anu had left, Earth mission was launched in earnest. As more Inunaki landed on Earth, their number rose in time to 600. Some were assigned to the lower world to help Enki mine the gold. Others manned the ore ships, and the rest stayed with Enlil in Mesopotamia. There, additional settlements were established in accordance with a master plan laid out by Enlil as part of a complete organizational plan of action and clear-cut procedures. He perfected the procedures the divine ordinances, established five cities in perfect places, called them by name, laid them out as centers. The first of these cities, Eridu, he granted to Nadimud, the pioneer. 
Each of these pre-Diluvian settlements in Mesopotamia had a specific function revealed by its name. First was Eridu, house in faraway built, the gold extracting facility by the water's edge, which for all time remained Ea's Mesopotamian abode. Next came Bad Tabira, bright place where the ores are made final, the metallurgical center for smelting and refining. Next, Lerarak, seeking the bright glow, was a beacon city to guide the landing shuttlecraft. Sipar, bird city, was the landing place. Shurupak, the place of utmost well-being, was equipped as a medical center. It was put in charge of Sud, she who resuscitates, a half-sister of both Inki and Enlil. Another beaking city, La Arsa, seeing the red light, was also built, for the complex operation depended on close coordination between the Anunnaki who had landed on Earth and 300 astronauts, called Igigi, those who see and observe, who remained in constant Earth orbit, Acting as intermediaries between Earth and Nibiru, the Agigi stayed in Earth's skies on orbiting platforms to which the processed ores were delivered from Earth by shuttlecraft, thereafter to be transferred to proper spaceships, which could ferry the gold to the home planet as it periodically neared Earth in its vast elliptical orbit. Astronauts and equipment were delivered to Earth by the same stages, in reverse, all of that required a mission control center, which Enlil proceeded to build and equip. It was called Nibruki, the earth place of Nibiru, Nipper in Akkadian. There, atop an artificially raised platform equipped with antennas, the prototype of the Mesopotamian Towers of Babel, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading Figure 24, was a secret chamber, the Durga, dark glowing chamber where space charts the emblems of the stars were displayed and where the Duranki bond heaven earth was maintained the chronicles have asserted that the first settlements of the Anunnaki on earth were laid out as centers to this enigmatic statement was added the puzzle of the claim by post diluvian kings that in re-establishing in Sumer the cities wiped out by the flood they had followed the everlasting ground plan, that which for all time the construction has determined. It is the one which bears the drawings from the olden times and the writings of the upper heaven. The puzzle will be solved if we mark out those first cities established by Enki and Enlil on the region's map and connect them with concentric circles. They were indeed laid out as centers all were equidistant from the mission control center in Nipper. It was indeed a plan from upper heaven, for it made sense only to those who could view the whole Near East from high above Earth. Choosing the twin-peaked Mount Ararat, the area's most conspicuous feature as their landmark, they placed the spaceport where the North Line based on Ararat crossed the visible Euphrates River. In this everlasting ground plan, all the cities were arranged as an arrow, marking out the landing path to the spaceport at Sipar, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading Figure 25. The periodic deliveries of gold to Nibiru mitigated the concerns. Even the rivalries on that planet, for Anu stayed on as its ruler for a long time thereafter. But on Earth, all the main actors were present on the dark-hued stage to give vent to every imaginable emotion and to incredible conflicts. Anu's first visit to Earth and the decisions then reached set the course of events on Earth for all the millennia that followed. In time, they led to the creation of the Atom, man as we know him, Homo sapiens. They also planted the seeds of future conflict on Earth between Enlil and Enki and their descendants. But first, there were the lingering and bitter struggles between the House of Anu and the House of Alalu, 
an enmity that burst out on earth into the War of the Titans. It was a war that pitted the gods who are in heaven against the gods who are upon dark-hued earth. It was, in its last climactic phase, an uprising of the Agigi. That it had taken place in the early days of the settlement of the Nibiruans on Earth, and in the aftermath of Anu's first visit to Earth, we know from the Kingship in Heaven text. Recalling the adversaries, it refers to them as the mighty Olden Gods, the gods of the Olden Days. After naming five ancestors as the fathers and mothers of the gods, who preceded Anu and Alalu, it begins the tale with the usurpations of the throne on Nibiru, the flight of Alalu, the visit of Anu to Earth, and the ensuing conflict with Kumarbi. The story in the Kingship in Heaven text is augmented and continued in several other Hittite Hurrian texts, which scholars call collectively the Kumarbi Cycle. Laboriously pieced together and still badly fragmented, the texts have recently become more intelligible by the discovery of additional fragments and versions reported and fitted into place by H. Guterbach and H. Auten. How long Kumarbi remained aloft after the fight with Anu is not clear from these texts. We do learn that after the passage of some time, and after Kumarbi managed to spit out the stones that Anu caused to grow in his belly, Kumarbi came down to earth. For reasons that may have been explained in missing parts of the texts, he went to Ea in the Abzu, Mutilated verses then deal with the appearance on the scene of the storm god Teshub, who, according to the Sumerians, was Enlil's youngest son, Ishkur, a dad. The storm god annoys Kumarbi by telling him of the wonderful attributes and objects that each god will grant him, Teshub. Among these attributes shall be wisdom, which shall be transferred away from Kumarbi, Filled with fury, Kumarbi went to Nippur. Breaks in the texts leave us ignorant as to what went on there at Enlil's headquarters, but after a stay of seven months, Kumarbi went back to consult with Ea. Ea suggested that Kumarbi ascend to heaven and seek the help of Lama, who was mother of the two gods, and thus apparently an ancestral matriarch of the two contesting dynasties. With some self-interest, Ea offered to transport Kumarbi to the celestial abode in his Margida, celestial chariot, which the Akkadians called Tiia Rita, the flying vehicle. But the goddess, having found out that Ea was coming without the permission of the assembly of the gods, sent lightning winds against Ea's spacecraft, forcing him and Kumarbi to return to Earth. But rather than go down all the way, Kumarbi chose to stay with the orbiting gods whom the Hittite Hurrian text calls Ursira, those who see and orbit, the Sumerian Agigi. With ample time on his hands, Kumarbi was full with thoughts Thinking them out in his mind, he nurses thoughts of creating misfortune. He plots evil. The essence of his thoughts was that he should be proclaimed the father of all the gods, the supreme deity. Gaining the backing of the orbiting Ursira gods, Kumarbi put swift shoes on his feet and flew down to earth. There he sent his emissary to the other leading gods, demanding that they recognize his supremacy. It was then that Anu decided that enough was enough, to vanquish once and for all the grandson of his adversary Alalu. Anu ordered his own grandson, the storm god Teshub, to find Kumarbi and kill him. Ferocious battles then ensued between the terrestrial gods led by Teshub and the sky-born gods led by Kumarbi, in one battle alone, no less than 70 gods participated, 
all riding in celestial chariots. Though most battle scenes are lost in the damaged text, we know that in the end, Teshub had prevailed. But the defeat of Kumarbi did not end the struggle. We learn from additional Hittite epic tales in the Kumarbi cycle that before his demise, Kumarbi managed to impregnate a goddess of the mountain with his seed, leading to the birth of his avenger, the stone god Ulikumi. As he hid his marvelous or monstrous son among the Ursira gods, he instructed him to grow and attack Teshub's beautiful city, Kumia, attack the storm god and tear him to pieces, shoot down all the gods from the sky like birds. Once he attained victory on earth, Ulakumi was to ascend to heaven for kingship and seize by force the throne on Nibiru. Having issued these instructions, Kumarbi passed away from the scene. For a long time the child was hidden, but as he grew up, assuming giant proportions, he was seen one day by Utu Shamash as he was roaming the skies. Utu rushed to Teshub's abode to inform him of the appearance of the Avenger. After giving Utu food and drink to becalm himself, Teshub urged him to mount thy chariot and ascend to the skies to keep an eye on the growing Ulakumi. Then he went up the mountain of viewing to see the stone god for himself. He looked at the awesome stone god and in wrath shook his fist. Realizing there was no alternative to battle, Teshub readied his chariot for combat. The Hittite text calls it by its Sumerian name, Iduga, the flowing leaden rider. The instructions for outfitting the celestial chariot, for which the Hittite text heavily employed the original Sumerian terminology, merit quoting. They called for revving up the vehicle with the great cracker, attaching the bull power plant and lights up in front, and the bull for lofty missile in the back end, installing the radar-like or navigational device, that which shows the way in the forepart, activating the instruments with the powerful energy stones, minerals, and then arming the vehicle with the storm thunderer, loading it with no less than 800 fire stones. The great cracker of the bright lead rider, let them lubricate with oil and stir up. The bull that lights up, let them put between the horns. The tail's bull that is lofty missile, let them plate with gold. The four parts that which shows the way, let them put in and turn, provide it with powerful stones inside. Let them bring out the storm thunderer, which scatters rocks for 90 furlongs, making sure the fire stones with 800 to cover. The lightning which flashes frightfully, let them bring out from its storage chamber. Let them bring out the Margida and make it ready. From the skies, from among the clouds, the storm god set his face upon the stone god. After the initial unsuccessful attacks, Ninurta, the brother of Teshu Badad, joined the battles. But the stone god remained unharmed and carried the battle to the very gates of Kumia, the storm god's city. In Kumia, Teshub's spouse, Habat, was following the battle reports in an inner chamber of the god's house. But the missiles of Ulakumi forced Habat to leave the house, and she could no longer hear the messages of the gods, neither the messages of Teshub nor the messages of all the gods. She ordered her messenger to put the swift shoes on his feet and go to the place where the gods were assembled to bring back news of the battle for she feared that the stone god may have killed my husband, the noble prince. But Teshub was not killed. Advised by his attendant to hide at some mountainous sites, he refused. If we do that, he said, there will be no king in heaven. The two then decided to go to Ea in the Abzu to seek there an oracle according to the old tablets with the words of fate. 
realizing that Kumarbi had brought forth a monster that was getting out of hand, Ea went to Enlil to warn him of the danger. Ulakumi will block off the heaven and the gods' holy houses. An assembly of the great Anunnaki was called. With all at a loss for a solution, Ea had one. From the sealed storehouse of the stone cutters, let them bring out a certain olden metal cutter, and let them cut under the feet of Ulukumi, the stone god. When this was achieved, the stone god was crippled. When the gods heard this, they came to the place of assembly, and all the gods began to bellow against Ulukumi. Teshub, encouraged, jumped into his chariot. He caught up with the stone god Ulukumi at the sea, and engaged him in battle. But Ulakumi was still defiant, declaring, Kumia I shall destroy, the sacred house I shall take over, the gods I shall drive out, up to heaven I shall go to assume kingship. The closing lines of the Hittite epic are completely damaged. But can we doubt that they told us the Sanskrit tale of the final battle between Indra and the demon Vritra? And then was seen a dreadful sight, when God and demon met in fight, his sharpened missiles Vritra shot, his thunderbolts and lightnings hot. The lightnings then began to flash, the direful thunderbolts to crash, by Indra proudly hurled. And soon the knell of Vritra's doom was sounded by the clang and boom of Indra's iron shower. Pierced, cloven, crushed, with horrid yell, the dying demon headlong fell, and Indra smote him with a bolt between the shoulders. These, we believe, were the battles of the gods and the titans of the Greek tales. No one has yet found the meaning of titans, but if the tales had a Sumerian origin, and if so did these gods' names, then Tai Ta'an in Sumerian would have literally meant those who in heaven live, precisely the designation of the Igigi led by Kumarbi, and their adversaries were the Anunnaki, who are on earth. Sumerian texts indeed record an olden life and death battle between a grandson of Anu and a demon of a different clan. The tale is known as the myth of Zu. Its hero is Ninurta, and Lil's son by his half-sister Sud. It could well have been the original tale from which the Hindu and Hittite tales were borrowed. The setting for the events described in the Sumerian text is the time that followed Anu's visit to Earth. Under the overall command of Enlil, the Anunnaki have settled to their tasks in the Abzu and in Mesopotamia. The ores are mined and transported, then smelted and refined. From a busy spaceport in Sippar, shuttlecraft take the precious metals aloft to the orbiting stations operated by the Igigi, thence on to the home planet by periodically visiting spaceships. The complex system of space operations, the comings and goings by the space vehicles and communications between Earth and Nibiru, while both planets pursue their own destined orbits, is coordinated from Enlil's Mission Control Center in Nipper. There, atop a raised platform, was the Durga Room, the most restricted Holy of Holies, where the vital celestial charts and orbital data panels, the Tablets of Destinies, were installed. It was into this sacred chamber that a god named Zu gained access, seizing the vital tablets and thereby holding in his hands the fate of the Anunnaki on Earth and of Nibiru itself. By combining portions of old Babylonian and Assyrian versions of the Sumerian text, a good deal of the tale has been restored, but damaged portions still held the secret of Zu's true identity, as well as an explanation of how he had gained access to the Durga. Only in 1979 did two scholars come up with the answer by using a tablet found in the Babylonian collection of Yale University to reconstruct the beginning of the ancient tale. In Sumerian, the name Zu meant he who knows, one expert in certain knowledge. 
Several references to the evil hero of this tale, as Anzu, he who knows the heavens, suggest a connection with the space program that had linked Earth with Nibiru. And the now restored beginning of the Chronicle indeed relates how Zu, an orphan, was adopted by the astronauts who manned the shuttlecraft and orbiting platforms, the Agigi, learning from them the secrets of the heavens and of space travel. The action begins as the Agigi, being gathered from all parts, decided to make an appeal to Enlil. Their complaint was that, until that time for the Agigi, a break taking place had not yet been built. In other words, there simply was no facility on Earth for the rest and recreation of the Agigi, where they could relax from the rigors of space and its weightlessness. To voice their complaint, they selected Zu to be their spokesman, sending him to Enlil's center in Nippur. Enlil, the father of the gods, in the Dur Anki, saw him and thought of what they, the Agigi, said. As in his mind he pondered the request, he studied the heavenly zoo closely. Who, after all, was this emissary, not one of the astronauts, and yet wearing their uniform? As his suspicions grew, Ea, aware of Zu's true ancestry, spoke up. He suggested to Enlil that a decision on the request of the Agigi could be postponed if Zu were delayed at Enlil's headquarters. Your service let him enter, Ea said to Enlil. In the sanctuary, to the innermost seat, let him be the one to block the way. To the words that Ea spoke to him, the god Enlil consented. At the sanctuary, Zu took up his position. At the entrance to the chamber, Enlil had assigned him. And so it was with Ea's connivance that an adversary god, a secret descendant of Alalu, was admitted to Enlil's innermost and most sensitive chamber. There, Zu constantly views Enlil, the father of the gods, the god of the bond heaven-earth. His celestial tablet of destinies, Zu constantly views. And soon a scheme took shape, the removal of the Enlil ship he conceives in his heart, I will take the celestial tablet of destinies, the decrees of the gods I will govern. I will establish my throne, be master of the heavenly decrees. The Agigi in their space I will command. His heart having thus plotted aggression, Zu saw his chance one day as Enlil went to take a cooling swim. He seized the tablet of destinies in his hands, and in his bird took off and flew to safety in the Hur Sagmu, mountain of the sky chambers. No sooner had this happened than everything came to a standstill. Suspended were the divine formulas. The lighted brightness petered out. Silence prevailed. In space, the Agigi were confounded. The sanctuary's brilliance was taken off. At first, Father and Lil was speechless. As the communications were restored, the gods on earth gathered one by one at the news. Anu, on Nibiru, was also informed. It was clear that Zu must be captured and the Tablet of Destinies restored to the Durga. But who will do it? Several of the younger gods known for their valor were approached, but none dared track Zu to the distant mountain, for he was now as powerful as Enlil having also stolen the brilliance of Enlil, and he who opposes him shall become as clay. At his brilliance, the gods waste away. It was then that Ninurta, Enlil's legal heir, stepped forth to undertake the task. For as his mother Sud had pointed out, Zu deprived not only Enlil, but also Ninurta of the Enlil ship. She advised him to attack Zu in his hideaway mountain also with a weapon of brilliance, but to do so only after he was able to approach Zu behind a dust screen. To achieve the latter, she lent Ninurta her own seven whirlwinds that stir up the dust. With his battle courage grown firmer, Ninurta repaired to Mount Hatsi, the mountain encountered in the Kumarbi Tales, where he hitched to his chariot his seven weapons 
attached the whirlwinds that stir up the dust, and set out against Zhu to launch a terrifying war, a fierce battle. Zhu and Ninurta met at the mountainside. When Zhu perceived him, he broke out in rage. With his brilliance, he made the mountain bright as daylight. He let loose rays in a rage. Unable to identify his challenger because of the dust storm, Zhu shouted to Ninurta, I have carried off all authority, the decrees of the gods I now direct. Who are thou to come fight with me? Explain yourself. But Ninurta continued to advance aggressively against Zhu, announcing that he was designated by Anyu himself to seize Zhu and restore the Tablet of Destinies. Hearing this, Zhu cut off his brilliance and the face of the mountain was covered with darkness. Unafraid, Ninurta entered the gloom. From the breast of his vehicle, he let loose a lightning at Zhu, but the shot could not approach Zhu. It turned back. With the powers Zhu had obtained, no lightning bolt could approach his body. So the battle was stilled, the conflict ceased, the weapons were stopped in the midst of the mountain, they vanquished not Zhu. Stalemated, Ninurta asked his younger brother Ishkur, Adad, to obtain the advice of Enlil. Ishkur, the prince, took the report, the news of the battle he reported to Enlil. Enlil instructed Ishkur to go back and tell Ninurta, In the battle do not tire, prove thy strength. More practically, he sent Ninurta a tilu, a missile, to attach to the stormer that shoots the projectiles. Ninurta, in his whirlwind bird, he said, should then come as close as possible to the bird of Zhu, until they are wing to wing. Then he should aim the missile at the pinions of Zhu's whirlbird, and let the missile fly like a lightning. When the fiery brilliance will engulf the pinions, his wings will vibrate like butterflies. Then will Zhu be vanquished. The final battle scenes are missing from all the tablets, but we know that more than one whirlbird participated in the combat. Fragments of duplicates found in the ruins of a Hittite archive at a site now called Sultan Tepe tells us that Ninurta arrayed seven whirlwinds which stir up the dust, armed his chariot with the ill winds, weapons, and attacked Zhu as suggested by his father, the earth shook, the illegible became dark, the skies became black, the pinions of Zhu were overcome. Zhu was captured and brought back before Enlil and Nipper. The Tablet of Destinies was reinstalled where it belonged. Lordship again entered the Eker. The divine formulas were returned. The captured Zhu was put on trial before a court-martial consisting of the seven great Anunnaki. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. Ninurta, his vanquisher, cut his throat. Many depictions were found showing the trial scene, in which Zhu, on account of his association with the Agigi astronauts, was dressed up as a bird. An archaic relief found in central Mesopotamia illustrated the actual execution of Zhu. This one shows Zhu, who belonged to those who observe and see as a demonic cock with an extra eye in the forehead, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading, Figure 26. The defeat of Zhu lingered in the memory of the Anunnaki as a great deliverance, perhaps because of the assumption that the spirit of Zhu, representing betrayal, duplicity, and all evil in general, persists in causing ill and suffering. The trial and execution of Zhu were transmitted to mankind's generations in the form of an elaborate ritual. In this annual commemoration, a bull was chosen to stand for Zhu and atone for his evil deed. Long instructions for the ritual have been found in both Babylonian and Assyrian versions, all indicating their earlier Sumerian source. After extensive preparations, a great bull, strong bull, who treads upon clean pastures, was brought into the temple and purified on the first day of a certain month. 
It was then whispered into the bull's left ear through a reed tube, Bull, the guilty zoo are you, and into the right ear, Bull, you have been chosen for the rite and the ceremonies. On the fifteenth day, the bull was brought before the images of the seven gods who judge, and the symbols of the twelve celestial bodies of the solar system. The trial of Zu was then reenacted. The bull was put down before Enlil, the great shepherd. The accusing priest recited rhetorical accusational questions, as though addressed to Enlil. How could you have given the stored treasure to the enemy? How could you have let him come and dwell in the pure place? How could he gain access to your quarters? Then the play-acting called for Ea and other gods to beseech Enlil to calm himself, for Ninurta had stepped forward and asked his father, Point my hands in the right direction. Give me the right words of command. Following this recital of the evidence given at the trial, judgment was passed. As the bull was being slaughtered in accordance with detailed instructions, the priests recited the bull's verdict. His liver was to be boiled in a sacrificial kettle. His skin and muscles were to be burned inside the temple. But his evil tongue shall remain outside. Then the priests, playing the roles of the other gods, broke out in a hymn of praise to Ninurta. Wash your hands, wash your hands, you are now as Enlil, wash your hands. You are as Enlil upon the earth. May all the gods rejoice in you. When the gods looked for a volunteer to fight Zu, they promised the vanquisher of Zu, Thy name shall be the greatest in the assembly of the great gods. Among the gods, thy brothers, thou shall have no equal. Glorified before the gods and potent shall be thy name. After Ninurta's victory, the promise had to be kept, but therein was the rub and the seed of future fights among the gods. Ninurta was indeed in Lil's legal heir, but on Nibiru, not on earth. Now, as the commemorative temple ritual makes clear, he was made as in Lil upon earth. We know from other texts dealing with the gods of Sumer and Akkad that their hierarchical order was also expressed numerically. Anu was given the highest number of the Sumerian sexagesimal system, 60. His legal heir in Lil had the rank of 50, the firstborn son and heir in the event of Enlil's demise, Ea, was forty. Now, as the enigmatic statement that Ninurta has become as Enlil attests, he too was given the rank of fifty. The partly mutilated ending of the temple ritual text contains the following legible verses. O Marduk, for your king speak the words. I release, O Adad, for your king speak the words, I release. We can safely guess that the mutilated lines also included a similar release by Sin of his claim to kingship among the gods and recognition of Ninurta's Enlilship. We know that thereafter, Sin, Enlil's firstborn on earth, held the rank of thirty, his son Shamash, twenty, and his daughter Ishtar, fifteen, and Ishkur, a dad in Akkadian, the rank of ten. There is no record of Marduk's numerical rank. The conspiracy of Zu and his evil plotting remained also in mankind's memory, evolving into a fear of bird-like demons who can cause affliction and pestilence, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading figure 27. Some of these demons were called Lilu, a term that played on the double meaning to howl and of the night. Their female leader, Lilitu, Lilith, was depicted as a naked winged goddess with bird-like feet, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading figure 28. The many Sherpu, purification by burning texts, that have been found were formulas for incantations against these evil spirits, forerunners of the sorcery and witchcraft that had lasted throughout the millennia.
In spite of the solemn vows taken after the defeat of Zhu to honor and respect Enlil's supremacy and Ninurta's position as second-in-command, the basic factors causing rivalry and contention had remained, breaking into the open from time to time in the ensuing millennia. Realizing that this would be so, Anyu and Enlil provided Ninurta with new marvelous weapons. Anyu gave him the Shar-Ur, Supreme Hunter, and the Shar-Gaz, Supreme Smiter. Enlil gave him several weapons, of which the unique Ib, a weapon with 50 killing heads, was the most awesome, leading to references in the Chronicles to Ninurta as the Lord of the Ib. Thus armed, Ninurta became the foremost warrior of Enlil, ready to fight off all challenges to the Enlil ship. The next such challenge came in the shape of a mutiny of the Anunnaki who were working in the gold mines of the Abzu. The mutiny and the events that led to it and followed it are fully described in a text called by scholars the Atrahasis Epic, a full-fledged earth chronicle which, in Taralia, records the events that had led to the creation of Homo sapiens, man as we know him. The text informs us that after Anyu had gone back to Nibiru and Earth was divided between Enlil and Enki, the Anunnaki toiled in the mines of the Abzu for forty counted periods, forty orbits of their planet, or 144,000 Earth years. But the work was difficult, and backbreaking inside the mountains in the deeply cut shafts, the Anunnaki suffered the toil. Excessive was their toil for forty counted periods. The mining operations deep inside the earth were never interrupted. The Anunnaki suffered the toil day and night. But as the shafts grew deeper and the toil harsher, dissatisfaction grew. They were complaining, backbiting, grumbling in the excavations. To help maintain discipline, Enlil sent Ninurta to the Abzu, but this strained relations with Enki even more. It was then that Enlil decided to go to the Abzu and personally evaluate the situation. The discontented Anunnaki seized the opportunity to mutiny. The Atrahasis Chronicle, in language as vivid as that of a modern reporter, in more than 150 lines of text, unambiguously describes the events that followed. How the rebellious Anunnaki put their tools on fire, and in the middle of the night, marched on Enlil's dwelling. How some shouted, let us kill him, let us break the yoke. How an unnamed leader reminded them that Enlil was the chief officer of old time, and advised negotiations. And how Enlil, Enraged, took up his weapons, but he too was reminded by his chamberlain, My lord, these are your sons. As Enlil remained a prisoner in his own quarters, he sent a message to Anyu and asked that he come to earth. When Anyu arrived, the great Anunnaki assembled for a court-martial. Enki, ruler of the Abzu, was also present. Enlil demanded to know who the instigator of the mutiny was, calling for a death penalty. Not getting the support of Anyu, Enlil offered his resignation. Noble one, he said to Anyu, take away the office, take away the power, to heaven will I ascend with you. But Anyu, calming Enlil, also expressed understanding of the miners' hardships. Encouraged, Inki opened his mouth and addressed the gods. Repeating Anyu's summation, he had a solution to offer. While the chief medical officer, their sister Sud, was here in the Abzu with them, let her create a primitive worker and let him bear the yoke. Let the worker carry the toil of the gods. Let him bear the yoke. In the following 100 lines of the Atrahasis text, and in several other Creation of Man texts that have been discovered in various states of preservation, the tale of the genetic engineering of Homo sapiens has been told in amazing detail. To achieve the feat, 
Enki suggested that a being that already exists, Ape Woman, be used to create the Lulu Amilu, the mixed worker, by binding upon the less evolved beings the mold of the gods. The goddess Sud purified the essence of a young male Anunnaki. She mixed it into the egg of an ape woman. The fertilized egg was then implanted in the womb of a female Anunnaki for the required period of pregnancy. When the mixed creature was born, Sud lifted him up and shouted, I have created, my hands have made it. The primitive worker, Homo sapiens, had come into being. It happened some 300,000 years ago. It came about through a feat of genetic engineering and embryo implant techniques, which mankind itself is beginning to employ. There has undoubtedly been a long process of evolution, but then the Anunnaki had taken a hand in the process and jumped the gun on evolution, creating us sooner than we might have evolved on our own. Scholars have been searching for a long time for the missing link in man's evolution. The Sumerian texts reveal that the missing link was a feat of genetic manipulation performed in a laboratory. It was not a feat over and done with in an instant. The texts make clear that it had taken the Anunnaki considerable trial and error to achieve the desired perfect model of the primitive worker. But once achieved, a mass production process was launched. Fourteen birth goddesses at a time were implanted with the genetically manipulated ape women eggs, seven to bear male and seven to bear female workers. As soon as they grew up, the workers were put to work in the mines, and as their numbers grew, they assumed more and more of the physical chores in the Abzu. The armed clash between Enlil and Inki that was soon to take place, however, was over these same slave laborers. The more the production of ores improved in the Abzu, the greater was the workload on the Anunnaki that had remained to operate the facilities in Mesopotamia. The climate was milder, rains were more plentiful, and the rivers of Mesopotamia were constantly overflowing. Increasingly, the Mesopotamian Anunnaki were digging the river, raising dikes, and deepening the canals. Soon they too began to clamor for the slave workers, the creatures of bright countenance, but with thick black hair. The Anunnaki stepped up to Enlil, black-headed ones they were requesting of him, to the black-headed people to give the pickaxe to hold. We read of these events in a text named by Samuel N. Kramer, The Myth of the Pickaxe. Though portions are missing, it is understood that Enki refused Enlil's request for the transfer of primitive workers to Mesopotamia. Deciding to take matters into his own hands, Enlil took the extreme step of disconnecting the communications with the home planet. In the bond Heaven-Earth, he made a gash Verily did he speed to disconnect heaven from earth. Then he launched an armed attack against the land of the mines. The Anunnaki in the Abzu assembled the primitive workers in a central compound, strengthening its walls against the coming attack. But Enlil fashioned a marvelous weapon, the Alani, axe that produces power, equipped with a horn and an earth splitter, that could drill through walls and earthworks. With these weapons, Enlil drove a hole through the fortifications. As the hole widened, primitive workers were breaking out toward Enlil. He eyed the black-headed ones in fascination. Thereafter, the primitive workers performed the manual tasks in both lands. In the land of the mines, they bore the work and suffered the toil. In Mesopotamia, with picks and spades, they built God's houses. They built the big canal banks, food they grew for the sustenance of the gods. Many ancient drawings engraved on cylinder seals depicted these primitive workers performing their tasks, naked as the animals of the field, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading, Figure 29. Various Sumerian texts 
recorded this animal-like stage in human development. When mankind was first created, they knew not the eating of bread, knew not the dressing of garments, ate plants with their mouth like sheep, drank water from the ditch. How long, however, could young female Anunnaki be asked, or forced, to perform the roles of birth goddesses? Unbeknownst to Enlil, and with the connivance of Sud, Enki contrived to give the new creature one more genetic twist, granting to the hybrid beings, incapable of procreating, as all hybrids are, the ability to have offspring, the sexual knowing for having children. The event is echoed in the biblical tale of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and although the original Sumerian text of the tale has not yet been found, a number of Sumerian depictions of the event were indeed discovered. They show different aspects of the tale, the tree of life, the offering of the forbidden fruit, the angry encounter that ensued between the Lord God and the serpent. Yet another shows Eve girdled in a garment around her loins while Adam is still naked, which can be found in the bonus PDF under the heading Figure 30, another detail related in the Bible. The Bible in the original Hebrew calls the God who tempted Eve Nahash, translated serpent, but literally meaning he who solves secrets and he who knows metals. The exact parallels of the God's name in the Sumerian depiction. This depiction is of further interest because it shows the serpent God with his hands and feet in tethers, suggesting that Enki was arrested after his unauthorized deed. In his anger, Enlil ordered the expulsion of the Adam, the Homo sapiens earthling, from the Eden, the abode of the righteous ones. No longer confined to the settlements of the Anunnaki, man began to roam the earth. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and she bore again his brother Abel. The gods were no longer alone on earth. Little did the Anunnaki then know the role that the primitive worker would play in the wars between them.